Okay, my friends, get ready because this is going to be interesting. Cold Fusion is back. There's just one problem. Well, I know what their problem is. Now, this is a Sabine Hassenfelder, and she's a physicist. She's got a ton of people, you know, watching this. 339,000 people already in just a week or so. Now, I am going to explain to you what that problem is right now. Okay, like Sabine said, there's one little problem. And the little problem is, is that the physicists don't realize that you don't have to use atoms and crush them to release a whole ton of energy, fuse big atoms. We can separate, cause fission, and then fuse them back together, which is, f is fusion. If we separate them and cause fission, and then put them back together, that's fusion. In between, look at the amount of energy. It's absolutely staggering. This is what it started out with. It's pushing these particles through the atmosphere where every, every, other th every other particle has a magnetic field. So it's field to field. That's what gives you this effect. But the particle's way back here. It's like a particle way in the back and it has a field around it. That's what gives you wave particle duality. We accelerated that light right there. That's acceleration. You see it? And now the particle became visible and this is the particle right here. Before that, you couldn't see that particle. Right, back here, you can't see that particle. It's just a wave. But the particle's somewhere back in here. Or maybe it's right up here. I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest with you. You can't see it. <laughs> but now, all of a sudden, <laughs> it pulls out of there. And it slams into this single slit. Single slit. All we're using is light. That is fission right there, and I can show you this very clearly, and it is fusion back here again clearly, and these are the, what they call the uh, interference patterns, which overlap, they think, because of double slit, it's a single slit, first of all, and I understand why. Light spins, some of it goes that way, some of it comes over the top and goes that way, most of it goes through the center, but... The reason they set up these white stripes is because the white hates these other, all the other whites. Stay away from me. You stay away from me. All right, you stay in your lane, I'll stay in my lane. You stay in your lane, I'll stay in my lane. And that's what they're doing right there. That's nothing more than a magnetic pattern of pushing and shoving. And look at the increase in energy. It is staggering. All right, so I showed you fission. Those were attached together, the black and the white. And then the white one turned into a shower, electron shower, because that's the electron neutrino. The muon neutrino doesn't change. The black ball is just a black slammer. And it's exactly, if you look up What's the Point by Don Lincoln from Fermilab, he explains very elegantly that these, these have just energetic values and these are just slammers. They never change size or anything. So they can't get through the Venturi. That's because we designed the Venturi so that it would not allow that tiny particle, I mean these bigger particles to come through, only the tiny squishy ones. And that's what happened. All right, one last time. That's the particles that Don Lincoln shows from Fermilab. This is like a 2013. And here they are, we see them. And here they are separating and fusing back together, fusion and fusion. So we can do fusion, there's no question. Will it produce energy? I believe it does. All right, let's just wrap it up. The particles were together originally. They were just like that. They were photons. They had to crush the field to get through the venturi. No question that happened. These particles left that. This is well known that smartphones can see this just as, just as well as CERN. They have no better equipment here than we have. Just look it up. It's been since 2014. They're using cell phones to power muon networks. And that's what we're looking at is muons. and Well, there it is, muon. That's what they're looking for because it's the dark matter. And it's also gravity. It's just never been seen before because it is dark matter. And they are attached to the white matter, which is the glowy one. That's what, all we can see because they bounce. Anyway, we need to do a lot of work on this. It's very simple, though. That's the photon that bounces. That's the electron that burns. But they, are both, they all have 
dipole nature to them. And we separated them here. That is fission, separation, fusion back together. In here, I believe that's raw energy. And I believe we can do this. Hold on. I got it somewhere. Here it is. I've shown another bazillion times. All right. They come in. Bam! Right there. Here's the bam. Bam. Bam, 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 bam. And what happens is these black balls are like jackhammers. Pushing against the white and squirting it out through there in voluminous quantities of extremely high energy. High energy means energy. High energy means high energy. Okay, so what do I agree with and what don't I agree with? Department of Energy explains muons. And right away I come down and I look and they talk about the standard model. It says the muon is one of the fundamental subatomic particles. The most basic, the tiniest building block of the universe as described in the standard model. I agree with it. It is one of the tiniest ones. And the electron neutrino is the other one. Muons are similar to electrons, but weigh more than 207 times as much. I concur with that. I agree. All right. I don't understand why they're talking about things the way they're talking about them, because it, they claim right now that the muon and the electron neutrinos are attached together and then you get the showers, the electron showers, and the muons become sterile muons. Now this talks about muons being the, well, here's what it says. The muon is one of the fundamental subatomic particles, the most basic building blocks of the universe as described in the standard model of particle physics. Muons are similar to electrons, but they weigh more than 207 times as much. I agree with that. That's about the difference between an adult person and a small elephant. The muon is part of the lepton group. Now listen to this carefully. Leptons are fundamental particles. This means they are not made of even smaller pieces of matter. They're the smallest thing there is. Like other leptons, the muon is affected by only three of the four fundamental forces in the universe. Well, we could talk about all that stuff later. But the key is, these are the smallest pieces that exist, and that is exactly correct. And there they are right there. We would have always considered this to be an electron. It's a glowy little, burny little a negative particle, pushy, shovey. And the other black particle is just dark matter. It's always just been attached. We never knew it was attached. Nobody ever knew it. And two of these back-to-back -back are just like two little bar magnets, just like that. Just like that. But they can come apart, and that can go through you as electricity or static. It can lightning, electricity. When they're together, they're light. And when they're in big balls like this, each one of these being one of these, you end up with molecules and atoms. And they become somewhat stable, pretty much stable at about 1835, which is a proton. And it's got, it's a charge. It's got a charge because it's, it's not even number. 1836 is a neutron. No charge. It can't take on any more. It doesn't want to give one up. It's happy. If you got one less or one extra, it wants to take or give. That makes it reactive. That's why molecules work. They have to be charged. Anyway, there's, there's a lot to talk about, but these are the particles, and I show them. I, I, I'm not just guessing, I'm showing. And I think we can get free energy if we just take a little quick look at this stuff. All right, this is cool on a multitude of levels. Now, my contention is, is that a light-emitting diode, which these are all light-emitting diodes, this is in a little array of, of lights, and, and I took it apart, and these are all the diodes, and they're all in series, so or, or actually in parallel, so they all light up equally, and you get that visible light. Now, a light-emitting diode, all that means is when you put electricity into that diode, which means it has a only flow with one direction, so positive to negative, or negative to positive, however you want to consider it, but it won't go 
from negative back to negative. It's, it's just like a transistor. A transistor has electricity here and then it has a base. <coughs> they call it forward bias. If the electricity here is the same polarity as the base, it'll drag it through and go, uh, I'm sorry, it's a reverse polarity. So normally it's an open gap here, plus to minus, or plus to plus. Well, when this goes minus... Uh, okay, my friends, this is, this is cool on so many levels. These are the two primary particles. They, just, they don't get any smaller than this, and that's it. Now, what is happening? This glowy one is hitting these LEDs, light-emitting diodes. Well, a light emitter is a light receiver when you put light into it. You see this 0.004 volts? Watch if I cover that up. Boom, it goes down to zero. See it? Okay, that is just the, elect the light that's in the room. It's picking up that much to turn on that little light-emitting diode. Now watch this. If I take the red laser and I try to drive that LED to create electricity, I, I'm getting nothing. See, it's just still 0.003. It's not adding any elect... well, maybe 0.001 it's adding. Not even. No. So now, that's the red. The red has no power compared to the green. Now, I'm going to do the green, and you're going to see. Watch this. Where do you see that thing glow? Now, here, I'm going to come right up to it. I actually have to go up to, <coughs> excuse me, the 20 scale because the 0.000 doesn't work anymore. It's, it's too high. This is going to run about 2.5 volts. Watch this. And watch the glow. Boom. <laughs> Look at that. 2.42 volts. 2.43. That's 2.5 volts almost out of one of these. If you had 10 in a row, you'd have 24 volts. Now, you there's a certain amount of of electrons that have to flow too. That's the amperage. This is voltage is one thing, amperage is another thing. Amperage is quantity. Voltage is pressure. So we have the all the pressure we can want. We we just keep adding adding adding. We can have a thousand volts. But how much actual energy? That's what we need to do is find out is this producing the quantity of electrons? And I think it might well be. You know, I want you to just think about this for a minute. You saw the kind of power this thing put out. It could drove this thing to two and a half volts. All right, so there's only two AAA batteries in here. And, th you, you know, these things go for a long, long time, these little batteries. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, they can't use hardly any electrons at all. I mean, how big the, the thing doesn't even hardly weigh anything. So how could there be so much energy that can do all this stuff for such a long period of time stored in these little things? And when you take them out and you throw them away, they weigh basically the same thing they weighed before. So what, all we did was take out the excess electrons. Now, I'm seeing if these are electrons, and they are, these are electron neutrinos. See, electron neutrinos, the white ball, and now they turn into showers. Now, if we can harvest that back up away from the black balls, because normally they're together, so all we're going to get is excess ones. Normally they're together making matter. Okay, so now, what we did, though, was we took light, which we took the little bitty ones of these and smashed them in there and broke them all apart. Now, so when we want to pull these back together, in order to get them back into the dark matter, we can do some work with them. That's what this is. This is work. That's work. No question whatsoever, that is energy. If anybody's got a problem with that, I want to talk to them. That is energy. And you didn't have that energy back here. Nowhere is near that energy. None. Not even close. And it's fission and then fusion, and I believe right there is where we can harvest that energy. 
And here's what we can do with it, if that's possible. You see this? I'm only asking for somebody to do some very, very basic engineering to try to see, can we create a venturi and ex harvest vast amounts of energy here? If we can, we're golden. Something like this is a handheld device. You don't even have to plug this into the grid anywhere. All you're going to do is inside of this box, there's going to be a ton of little receiving um, chips and a ton of little, little tiny lasers. And then we're going to harvest it through and collect it and, and filter it and do all the things you have to do. And we could turn it into AC or DC. We could have 100 volts, 200 volts, 200, three, any, anything you want. You do anything you want once you harvest all that energy. And we could, if you could have enough amperage, that's the key. And I don't know if that's possible. But I believe, I believe it is possible. Because if you take a DC battery, well, let's not even bother talking about it. But I, I can tell, tell you something. They seem to put out vast quantities of electrons. Or you don't need vast quantities of electrons, and small quantities will do the job if you can put them in, in the right way, if you can separate them from the black. Because once they're attached to the black, they don't have really, you know, they're bouncy and everything, but they're not like they are when they're apart. This thing here, they slam back together. Okay, so my point is cold fusion is back and we can do it and we have done it and it's fission and then it's fusion and if we can harvest that energy, we're golden. And it could be handheld, no grid, carry them into places where they have disasters like these recent hurricanes and everything else and, uh, and you back up and running with no grid to worry about, just plug things into it and you start your cleanups. And, and this is the only way to keep the planet from getting destroyed because the gases are expanding. That's what's causing all this interaction with the atmosphere. We're just too compacted. The gases are just too tight against the earth or they just are not expanding enough. It's, got, it's very, very little to do with strictly carbon. Carbon dioxide, yes, it's a gas. Originally it was a solid, now it's a gas, so it's thousands of times bigger than it was originally. Eventually that puts pressure on, like blowing up a balloon, and that's where we are now. So we're spinning and we're getting hurricanes and tornadoes, and water is compressing in the atmosphere because it's OH particles in the atmosphere. They compress, they turn into water. All right, so it's time to, to look at this. This is the problem. Fusion is back, and the problem is they won't look.